The government's backed down from its controversial Three Waters entrenchment clause after an outcry that it would have set a dangerous constitutional precedent. But backing away is one thing, giving the public an explanation, a proper one, of exactly how this happened, quite another. Joining me this morning is, for regular Monday slot, is the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Morena, Prime Minister. Morena. Great to have you back on the show. Um, so last Monday you said this was not some, necessarily something you would be aware of, that this, this clause and the 60% entrenchment was happening. Since then, Nanai Mahuta has said that it was discussed in caucus that you were present. So, how... Uh, is that Ryan, sorry, just to... Again, you know how I don't really particularly like correcting you, uh, but uh, I also acknowledged last week, yes, it was discussed at caucus. I think, though, here the most important thing is uh, that, regardless, we're taking ownership of this as a team. It was an SOP that came from another party, um, but we, as a team, when it came before the House, voted in favour of it. Uh, we agree that was a mistake, not because of the subject matter, we don't want to privatise water assets, but because of the use of entrenchment. Uh, entrenchment, and we've talked about this, is commonly understood to be where you embed a supermajority yep. to change anything. Uh, our view is that, yes, actually, we should have some guardrails where and when that's used, so we'll be fixing it and removing those provisions. OK, so when you said it's not necessarily something you'd be aware of, what exactly were you referring to? My recollection of that conversation is I was asked about SOPs coming before caucus. I believe the point I was making at the time is you wouldn't necessarily have every individual, uh, and just not to get into too much technicality on it, every amendment that a party brings wouldn't necessarily go before a caucus. But yes. I confirmed, yes, it, this general issue was discussed. I haven't got into more detail than that because we're protecting the provision that we don't generally talk about what happens in caucus. But I think the most important point here, Ryan, is regardless of that, as a team, we're accepting mistakes been made. Yeah. And we're committing to fixing it. But it's it. important, isn't it? It's important for people at home to know: was this just, you know, incompetence, negligence? Was it? Was there something Machiavellian going on here that you did know about the provision, but you're now claiming? Sometimes you... these things are much more sim. Sometimes these things are actually just simple. A mistake was made. I've also but referenced how? the point that entrenchment is generally understood to be 75% a supermajority. Uh, the provision that went before the House was 60%. It was a novel approach. Regardless, our view is that using that provision, uh, we do need to be cautious about when that happens. And so that's why we're fixing so we, it. And it's also why, Ryan, we've proposed that in the future it would be useful for all parties in Parliament to come together and have a discussion around when those kinds of provisions come up. Because now we've seen a situation yeah, I, where the threshold has been dropped and it's been, it's been put you, before Parliament. But you did that. that. This is the point. You did that and we still don't know how it happened. So in order to stop this from happening again, shouldn't we find out what happened? Uh, again, Ryan, here, just again, I think it is important to point out this was not a uh, change or an amendment that was drafted by the government or by a minister. It was from another party. Did you read it? It is frequent. Like, well, yeah, we I know, but, but you would have read it, right? And no, no. I think the context is useful, Ryan, um, because, again, I think actually the context helps a little bit. Uh, when we have a number of amendments that will come through from other parties, yeah. n a number of them, uh, for any given bill, there could be, you know, well over a couple of dozen. In some cases, depending on the bill, if it's controversial, there can be hundreds. So this was put forward by another party. Yes, we voted in favour of it. Our view is we shouldn't have done that. We are fixing it, and in fact we're doing it in quite a speedy way. Usually these fixes can take a long time. Because the debate on the bill is not finished, it will probably take an hour. Okay. It needs to be fixed, and that's what we're doing. Did you know that it was 60% entrenchment during that caucus meeting? I've already given an answer to this issue multiple times. Entrenchment is commonly understood, commonly understood to be 75%. So did you think you were voting uh, for 75? Ryan, though, I think... I've, I've given as much explanation on this as I can uh, without becoming repetitive. Yeah, I know, but the thing is it's not really good enough explanation, is it? Because people still don't know actually what happened in that caucus meeting, whether you found out in that meeting about the 60% entrenchment, whether you had a problem with it then or whether the problem only emerged once you were told about it later. Again, as I've said, uh, the conversation around entrenchment, it is commonly understood to be 75. What was put before Parliament was not that. 
regardless, regardless, we are taking ownership of this as a team, Brian. And I actually think that's what people want to know. When you see a problem, uh, what do you do about it? And we are fixing it as quickly as we can. Are you saying you would have been happy to vote for 75%, which would be even worse, wouldn't it? Well, actually, again, I think the reason that entrenchment, of course, the idea is that you create a supermajority where basically uh, that's a situation where you have as many parliaments, as, uh, parties in Parliament uh, supporting it. Uh, and so, it, it, so, just to be clear, to put in place an entrenchment provision, you'd have to have that number mm. engaged in it as well. So the idea is that you get cross-party support for something. Right, but, but just but to again, be clear, you thought, it's commonly, you thought you were voting for 75% in the caucus meeting, and no, even it's... again... Oh, OK. It, Ryan, I don't want you to extrapolate out. The well, point make I'm making clear. is entrenchment is commonly understood to be 75%. What went before Parliament was separate to that. We accept entrenchment should be rarely used. It was a mistake. We're fixing it. OK. All right, we have to move on. Um, we've got other things to talk about. Um, there's a poll out this morning, um, a Courier Taxpayer Union poll, which is about the RNZ TVNZ merger. Apparently just 22% of Kiwis support it. Can you tell us how much, because obviously RNZ has its own budget, TVNZ has its own budget, they're going to be merged together. How much will we save per year by doing that? Oh, we already, I think the important point to, to make, we're not doing this as a cost-saving mechanism, Ryan. We're doing it because... I think people do value having a public broadcaster, and the moment that's in the form of Radio New Zealand and TVNZ. We also currently put taxpayer money in through New Zealand On Air and directly into RNZ to ensure that we have public broadcasting. I think one of the issues is that this is being painted as an issue where currently we don't pay anything, and therefore uh, somehow <laughs> what we're proposing is to put money where it currently doesn't go. We already fund these platforms. I the agree. issue is revenue is declining, yeah. and uh, I agree everyone with you. working in no, journalism knows that. The, the number of journalists is declining. Mm. That is not beneficial to anyone. What can we do to make sure that we strengthen public broadcasting in New Zealand? Now, currently, of course, with viewership and listenership declining, people are turning to alternative methods to access information and stories. How do we make sure our public broadcasters have a bit more flexibility to be in the places where the New Zealand public are? And that's what this is all about. Yeah. No, I know. I, I, I granted that's what that's what it's about for you, but for the public, 22% of people, by the way, supporting this, um, for them during a cost of living crisis and also when I inflation think about is more going than up, that again, the, don't know. Ryan, so if we were to read out the full, I believe it's close to 25% don't know. And that's because I think some of the issues haven't been well traversed. Uh, and look, that means that we need, to, uh, we need to continue to make that case as well. But I think when you look overseas and you see the BBC and the ABC, I think people would accept those are really strong broadcasting arms. We want the same for New Zealand. None of those companies are proposing to split them into radio and television. We're a bit unusual in the format that we have. We want to bring our entities together strengthen them yeah. and make sure uh, that we have a place where New Zealand stories are told. Cool. Netflix is not going to take responsibility for telling our stories. We need to, and we need to fund our platforms to be able to do that. Like, the, the problem, I think, is that like Moira and Timaru, mother of three this morning, is not thinking about the BBC or the ABC in Australia. She's thinking about the fact there's a cost of living crisis on. She's got a mortgage that's going through the roof, and they're looking to the government to say, what are you trying coming back on, what are you cutting down on? And the very first question I asked you on this story was how much will we save by merging the two entities? The answer seems to be yeah, nothing. In fact, it's I'm probably going here, to be Ryan, more expensive. Is that if we want to support, oh, and, and here, again, if we want to make sure that we are supporting New Zealanders through this rough period, getting rid of our public service broadcasters or having Radio New Zealand collapse doesn't help them and it actually How close doesn't is help RNZ? New Zealand. How close is RNZ uh, to if collapse? If I can finish my answer, Ryan, uh, New Zealanders absolutely need to know that their government is focused on them, which is why our core crown spending relative to GDP is decreasing. We are tightening our belt. It has gone from 34% down to 31% because we're asking New Zealanders to come through this tough time. We have to make sure we're prepared for it too. But would New Zealanders thank us for at the same time letting our public broadcasters collapse? No. 
We have to make sure that we still are able to make sure that people have access to news and information whilst also supporting them through a cost of living crisis. We can do both and that is absolutely what we're doing and we are cutting our cloth. Prime Minister, what's the latest advice you've had on how close Radio New Zealand is to collapse? Well, again, this is about projecting to the future. Their listenership is declining. You know that, I know that. The viewership of uh, our broadcasters on television uh, platforms outside of On Demand is declining. Uh, if we do nothing, we will have to increase the amount of money taxpayers put into those platforms generally anyway. We want to make sure when we do that, we're doing it in such a way that in the future, those broadcasters have the best possible position to continue to thrive. Number one concern around national security mis uh, at the moment, Ryan, is around uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation. People want to have trusted places they can access information. Our journalists have a role to play in that. Uh, and that's exactly why we're making sure our public broadcasters in this environment can survive. All right. Um, Prime Minister, very quickly before we go, Janik Patel, I'm sure you've, you've probably heard about this case, um, that his parents, there is a group calling for his parents to have fast-tracked uh, permanent residence visas. Do, do you know about this? Is the Minister of Immigration going to be involved yes. in some way? Uh, yes. I, and again, here I'll be uh, not wanting to dis disclose or uh, we're very careful about talking too openly about people's um, private private matters, but um, I've made sure that those who have been calling for that are aware of the work that is already underway. Um, I've met with the family, uh, spoken with the family. We're making sure that we're doing all we can to support them, and that includes uh, ensuring they have what they need to give them s stability. Uh, and as you can imagine at the moment, of course, uh, they have visas that will see them through for several months. We're working with them to make sure that they can just have a bit of peace of mind around some of those issues.